<coughs> so um, today we're going to start with uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, you read for today a section on his essay on the origin of language. Um, and I'll just start with uh, a little bit about Rousseau, just very briefly. Um, you can look this up yourself, but I'm just kind of summarizing for you a little bit. Um, he was born in Geneva, Switzerland in 1712 uh, and died in France in 1778. Um, he was a philosopher, a writer, also a composer. Um, he um, um, was famous for defending religious tolerance and he rejected the idea of original sin, uh, but that led to accusations of heresy and he was, um, for much of his life, sort of always kind of running away from um, some church or state authorities uh, because of his views on religion. Um, you know, t uh, t you know, so, uh, you know, wanting to promote religious tolerance, for example, sort of uh, brought with it this, this charge of indifference that, that, you know, he didn't care about religion, right? Uh, if you, you know, if you tolerate all religions, then, you know, maybe you just don't care. And in fact, he, he was born in, in Geneva, and so he was Calvinist in the beginning, um, but uh, when he was a, a pretty young man, he converted to Catholicism, um, and then later on, he converted back to Calvinism when he wanted to move back to Geneva. So, you know, this, uh, you know, people kind of got the sense that he didn't really care one way or another. So that was, you know, that was, that was heretical. So, uh, so he had a lot of problems in relationship to, uh, to the religious authorities, but also the state authorities that supported those religious authorities. Um, his um, important works included an essay, a discourse on the origin and basis of inequality among men, uh, a novel, Julie, uh, or the new uh, Heloise, uh, the social contract, a political essay uh, and confessions, a, a kind of autobiographical account of his life um, in which he tries to also kind of defend himself against his, uh, his attackers, right? So um, he, um, um, he wrote this essay that you've um, read on the origin of languages which treats of melody and musical imi imitation. Um, recall that long title where he was talking also about music and that's actually important about his for his theory of language. It was drafted around this period sort of maybe up to 1755 but he never published it during his lifetime and so it was uh, first published 1781 um, after he died. Okay, um, So keep that in mind especially when we when we get to the Hedda. So even though this was written before Hedda wrote his essay, uh, Hedda was not aware of this essay when he wrote his. Okay, So um, what are the main arguments here? Um, so Rousseau starts in his analysis from the idea um, that speech distinguishes, distinguishes humans from animals. So that's kind of the, the first point with which he opens the essay. Uh, but he also insists here, in contrast to both Hobbes and Warburton, um, that the origin of language must have been a natural one rather than a divine one. So he's, he's, not, he's not even going to consider the idea that, that God granted language to humans, right? That's just not in, in, his, uh, in his, I guess, vocabulary, I suppose, in, 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 in the way he's going to be discussing this problem. Um, and he indicates that language is also, it was the first social institution. Uh, and so with it, it, there's a kind of sense in which, as the first social institution, it really was the the first um, transition of humans from a kind of um, state of um, non-society uh, and sort of animal-like um, to a state of society and human society, all right? Um, but then he also insists um, that language was not a, uh, an in, a sort of a rational invention, but arose out of a kind of instinct, uh, a sort of kind of a natural, um, outgrowth of human instinct, uh, but something specific to humans, right? Um, so, um, I mean, if you keep, keep this in mind as we um, go through the later text of the course, um, the, uh, the book by Steven Pinky, recall, or uh, you, you, you'll, no, you'll notice, is called The Language Instinct, right? Um, and, and in some sense, you know, Rousseau's theories are kind of a, a predecessor of the theories of, of Pinker. I mean, though, I, I don't know that Pinker actually cites Rousseau. Um, but in any case, this idea um, that language began as a kind of instinct um, is something that links Rousseau and Pinker. So let's get into some of the uh, nitty gritty of what he's doing here, right? Um, he, um, he starts out with an argument that we're familiar with, 
uh, from Warburton, which is that images have a stronger effect um, than words do um, when, when used in order to try and convince somebody of something, right? Um, so he has this um, quote where he actually uses the same example that Warburton used, right? You remember this thing about Darius and the, uh, the mouse, the bird, the frog, and um, the arrow. So with Warburton, you remember um, the example was, it wasn't, it was, here it's, it's a, a frog, a bird, a mouse, and five arrows, right? So you, like, we got plenty of arrows for everybody, right? <laughs> Even more than we need, right? Um, whereas with Warburton, it was a, uh, remember it was a, a frog, a mouse, a bird, uh, a, I guess he called it a dart and a, a plow. So there was like a kind of like, oh, you know, you can go for war, you can go for peace, right? But we're ready for both in a sense, right? So uh, I'm, I'm not sure why Rousseau recalls this incident differently than, than Warburton, but in any case, they're using it sort of for the same reason, right? Because um, the claim here, um, this is actually on a different page than the example is on. So sometimes you kind of have to piece together the parts of the argument from different sections uh, of the work, um, is that um, uh, images speak more effectively um, than, than words, right? So this is, this is the, the same um, kind of thing that Warburton was saying. Um, and um, he's using the same evidence, right? Um, and uh, in a sense, sort of the same reason. He says, um, in the most vigorous language, everything is said symbolically before one actually speaks, right? Uh, and he's just sort of indicating how it is that images are more effective. And he's sort of using this example to sort of illustrate, you know, what a powerful image this could be. The warrant, though, is a little tricky. We, we're not really getting the warrant from Rousseau at this point, And it's not clear where he's going to give us that. So it's not, you know, it's uh, as compared to Warburton, uh, Rousseau's text is a little bit more, I, I don't know, maybe jumbled in, 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 in terms of the structures of the argument. Uh, but we'll, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go through and kind of track down and see where the warrants might be. Um, hold on. Yeah, okay. um, <coughs> let me get through the section first. Yeah. So um, there's a difference, um, though, between Warren, uh, Warburton and Rousseau in terms of the way they're arguing this, this, uh, this issue of images, right? Um, Rousseau has this second uh, example that he uses, which is also a very kind of harrowing example, it is this, the Levite of Ephraim. It's also, it's also a Bible story in this case, um, in which um, his wife was killed by these um, people from the tribe of Benjamin. And, in, and so what he did was that he divided up her dead wife into 12 pieces and sent the, t the 12 pieces to the different uh, different tribes of, of other tribes of Israel, and you know, said, "Look, look at this horrible thing that this this, this tribe has done," uh, and so he incites them to go and exterminate this this other tribe, right? Um, and he's using this as another example of of speaking through images, and, and it's and, and again, it's it's similar. Actually, it's most similar to when Warburton was talking about the way that image and action are very similar, or that they're speaking through action and speaking through images are similar, because both the, the uh, the sort of delivery of that mouse and frog and bird and, and, and arrows and this cutting up of somebody, you know, this, this, his wife into all these pieces, it's, it's an action at the same time as, it's, 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 as it creates this image, right? It creates this, um, this picture for people. But the link between the two is very important for both, right? And, and if you recall, with, uh, with Warburton, or, uh, you know, and the, 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 the Darius example, it's about, it's about, it's really an image of an action that's going to come in the future. If you come and invade, we're going to destroy you. You know, and that's kind of the, the, the action that, that it's sort of referring to. Here, there's a kind of image of an action that occurred in the past, right? So, so you know, so his, his wife was killed by these people. Um, and he's kind of reenacting that action by, um, by cutting her up into more pieces, right? And so it's, there's a kind of enactment of the action, uh, which kind of recalls the action uh, at the same time as it's, it's sort of acting it out again, right? And so there's, you know, there's, there's a sense in which the action itself, right, has this sort of character of an image, uh, and then the image is kind of borrowing that, um, that similarity between action and image in order to emphasize 
the relationship between the image and the action, right? Because in a sense, what, 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 the, what this type of activity or this type of communication depends upon um, is the kind of link that we're supposed to see between the image and the action. So that there's a, there's a kind of link between, I guess, idea and image, right? So the idea of the action and the image um, that you're trying to cement uh, by using that one uh, image to, to speak, right? Um, so again, they both, Warburton and Rousseau, sees this type of um, image as action or action as image as the, the sort of the beginning of language or so the, the, the sort of the, the, uh, the, the first examples of language uh, because they're so close to action. So in a sense, it's, you're, you're almost kind of emphasizing how actions themselves have a communicative quality and you can bring out that communicative quality um, through certain images that link back to the action quality uh, of the image, right? Okay. So, um, Rousseau then moves on to this next claim, or similar claim, I suppose, that, that words are better than image at stirring up passion. So, if images are good at communicating a kind of effect, he's saying that, that words are betty, better at stirring up passions. Um, so, um, Let's see, let's, let's, let's just read this passage for a moment so, so that we can get, we get his argument in our mind. But when it is a question of stirring the heart and inflaming the passions, it is an altogether different matter. The successive impressions of discourse, which strike a redoubled blow, produce a different feeling from that of the continuous presence of the same object, which can be taken in at a single glance. Right. Imagine someone in a painful situation that is fully known. As you watch the afflicted person, you are not likely to weep but give him time to tell you what he feels and soon you will burst into tears. It is solely in this way that the scenes of a tragedy produce their effect. So, you know, what he's sort of pointing to, and you know, his evidence is not like a specific thing that we point to, but he's, he's pointing to a kind of uh, an experience that he hopefully um, shares with us, that he, that he says, well, you know, if you look at an image of something, um, you might have, you know, there might be this big effect on you uh, and you might, understand some kind of message, but in order to really be moved, like through your emotions, your passions, um, the image is not the best way to do that. He's saying it's really, it has to be more of a story, in a sense, uh, a discourse, right? Um, that, um, th that kind of communicates you to the whole story of what's happened and why somebody is suffering. So the picture of somebody suffering, he says it's, it's not really gonna move you. But if you hear the whole story of you know, this, the reasons for the suffering and, and what all happened, then you will burst into tears. And this is, you know, he's, he's, he's referring to our experience of watching a tragedy, right? Of you know, some, some kind of a sad story uh, by which we would, you know, we might cry at the end, but we would never do so um, when we were looking at the image. Um, so, you know, I guess in some sense, you know, we're supposed to sort of kind of look into our experience and say, oh yeah, maybe that makes sense. Um, but he's, he, he piles on the evidence here, so it, 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 in effect, so all, all, a lot of his evidence is sort of repetitions of the same type of example. Um, but here again, we're not really getting a warrant. We're not really getting an explanation of why would this be? Um, and we're not, and so, and so I guess what I want you to sort of think through here at this point is just how, in effect, without the warrant, we're kind of just left to you know, repeating different examples and seeing if we can find a counterexample, right? So uh, maybe there is an image, you know, some, I don't know, some image of, you know, I don't know, some sad person or somebody who's, who's in a bad situation that could cause, you know, that could move you to passion just as much as, as the story could. And so if you could point out that, that, that example, then all of a sudden you've re kind of refuted the argument. And, and, and part of what's going on here is that he doesn't really have kind of the explanation for why this would be. Right? Um, though I think maybe he does have something kind of in the back of his mind, um, and, that, and then we kind of have to link it up. But that, that, that's something he's not kind of laying out very clearly as the way he's arguing. Um, but I'm going to suggest that he does have a kind of warrant here. Um, and this is on the next page, right? Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not very closely linked to this passage, and he doesn't really indicate that this really is the, the warrant, but um, <coughs> as, as it's a kind of a key passage for him, as we'll see f uh, throughout the rest of the text, I think that might function as the warrant. So it's, he says, the passions have their gestures, but they also have their accents. And these accents 
which thrill us, these tones of voice that cannot fail to be heard, <coughs> penetrate to the very depths of the heart, carrying there the emotions they wring from us, forcing us, in spite of ourselves, to feel what we hear. Right? And then <coughs> he goes back to the claim, we conclude that while visible signs can render a more exact imitation, sounds more effectively arouse interest. Right? So, so we, we, get, we get the same claim that he had you know, up, uh, up on the top in the previous page, um, but we do have this additional sort of explanation for why this would be, um, and the explanation is um, that passions are linked to accents. So accents in the, s in the sense of you're able to sort of, um, you know, in your speaking, you can, you can accent a particular word or you can, you know, you can emphasize one word or not emphasize other words um, and you can sort of vary and modulate your tone of voice. Um, and that's what he sees as somehow the characteristic of the passions that link them to a discourse rather than to an image. So an image, you can't really do that. You can't really modulate an image like you can modulate your voice and has sort of setting accents and, and, and not accents, right, in certain places, right? So, um, so he says that, that emotion really has a kind of um, integral link to this ability to kind of emphasize certain words and not emphasize other words and kind of create that, that difference in tone, right? Um, and and this is going to be sort of key to his overall argument about language, about la how, you know, what language is, and, and linking it up later on to music later. Um, we're not actually going to talk about the music part, but, um, but, but this is kind of how he's seeing language, is sort of similar to music in, in, the, same, in the sense that they, it, all music and language, they both have this quality uh, of you know, existing kind of in time, but then a, a being able to sort of set accents and articulations. Okay? Um, so that's the warrant, and it's not clear, you know, he's not really um, kind of giving us at this point anyway a, a, a real good <laughs> explanation for how, how this would be true and why, you know, how this would lead to that, that kind of um, similarity of passions and, and language and, and origins of language and passions that he will ultimately get to. But we're going to just leave this sort of as a kind of question mark for now.